So I want to welcome you all to the fourth event of the School of Education Centennial Conversation Series. I'm thrilled that so many of you are here with us today and we're expecting even more people to join us to discuss really critical topics that are going to help inform our next 100 years. Think about that. This conversation tonight will not only provide you with some of our ideas about the next 100 years, but you will actually be helping us think about how to move forward as we celebrate our legacy, but also seek to change the future. So the, that's important, right? The centennial is this unique opportunity to reflect on the history of the school, to celebrate the ways we've served as leaders and innovators and the ways we've served to shape the public good locally, nationally, and globally. We also though need to take care to apply a critical lens to ourselves and to our legacy. We have to consider the ways we've advanced excellent, just, and equitable education but also acknowledge those moments in which we've missed opportunities to do that, or even actually contributed to education problems. So this is a wonderful way to provide opportunities to learn from School of Education scholars and opportunities for us to bring together our collective expertise as we envision the future of our school and the future of education in the coming century. So this evening, we're going to hear from professors Don Purek, Liz Kolb, and Chris Quintana. And I'm sure many of you know, um, maybe all three or you know one in particular, that's why you've joined us tonight. Or maybe you just wanna know about you know, their views on education. They're gonna discuss what we've learned from the pandemic and how we might move forward to act on this knowledge. For the sake of brevity, we sent our panelists full biographies to you in advance. And so I hope you took a look at those because these are amazing scholars. They're leaders in every sense of the word. They are changing the way we think about our school of education and really moving the needle on important education innovation. So please join me in welcoming professors Purak, Cole, and Quintana. Now I'm going to start uh, with an introductory question from each, for each of them, and that'll kind of help you get to know who they are in case you don't know every one of them. And then we're going to go into some questions from the audience, and then we'll open it up. These are questions that you, you sent us, and then we're going to open it up to the, to the community here in this space. So I'm going to start, um, I actually think I'll start with Liz. And then we'll go to Don and then go to Chris. So I, that's good pedagogy to let them know the order so they can be thinking about you know, who goes next. And I'm gonna ask you each to share a bit about where you focus your research and what you see as one primary lesson learned from the work of schools during the pandemic. So Liz, I'm gonna to toss it over to you. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you everyone for joining us here tonight. I'm really thrilled to be part of this conversation and with my colleagues as well. Um, so I'm gonna try to be brief about the, the work that I do here at the School of Ed. I have the privilege of being able to work with pre-service and in-service teachers around integrating technology into their lessons and their projects. I also work with um, school administrators as well, um, uh, helping them better understand what effective technology integration looks like and, and kind of feels like in, in the schools. Um, so I primarily work in our teacher education department. Uh, about 10 years ago, I built a framework based on research on how to integrate technology. So it's using these research-based and learning sciences approach to student learning. Um, it's called the Tripoli Framework, and um, it has it, it has it, it's it's being used fairly widely by K twelve schools as part of their um, kind of principal walkthrough observations and evaluations, as well as professional development for their teachers. Um, so. When I'm done speaking, I can put in the chat a link to the framework if you're interested in, in taking a look at that or resources around it. But um, I want to pivot a little bit to the pandemic and 
remote learning and share what I have been doing um, in, in that space over the past year around this topic. Um, once uh, the uh, emergency remote learning hit, I decided to um, put out a survey to K-12 parents and teachers about their experiences during emergency remote learning. Um, and I really emphasize that it's emergency remote learning and emergency online learning, um, uh, not, not traditional methods of how we've used that. And um, the, the survey results were pretty robust. And I will, again, in the chat, I'll share the full results, which we, we have posted on the School of Ed um, website as well. Um, but there were some interesting uh, findings in it, and obviously I can't share all of them, but a couple of things that I do want to share um, that we learned about, um, one was that prior to COVID, most K-12 schools were not one-to-one -one meeting one device per child, so each child having a laptop or each child having an iPad. Um, most were not doing that, and the ones that were, most of them did not allow the children to bring those devices home. Um, and what we found was that during the remote learning, the emergency remote learning, that the, the schools that did allow the children to have one-to-one -one devices and bring them home prior to COVID remote learning had um, much better participation during the COVID remote learning, um, less kind of caregiver or parent frustration um, about what was going on at home with the remote learning um, because a lot of it came down to the students were more independent in being able to already use the technologies and have like the skills and the pedagogy. And um, we kind of coined this fluid continuity of learning between home and school and have learned how important this is um, to have what's happening at school with technology tools and strategies also happening at home. Um, a couple other findings too that might be kind of interesting. Um, one was that we found that prior to remote learning, uh, most teachers were not familiar with how to use digital tools to make learning accessible for students on IEPs um, or stu students with disabilities in any way. Um, while they may have known some kind of face-to-face um, -face methods, um, in-person methods, they weren't as familiar with um, actual um, digital tools for accessibility, and there's lots of them. Um, so um, that was something that uh, was a concern, but also a recommendation for our own kind of teacher preparation and, and doing a better job in that work. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, uh, one other piece um, that we found very interesting was that Title I schools um, tended to start much later with the emergency remote learning than schools that were not Title I. And, and for those of you not familiar with Title I is um, where the, the majority of students are um, lower income. And um, we found this to be problematic because when they started later for remote learning, um, they had much less participation um, and more um, uh, kind of problems occurred during those times. So those are a couple of the findings. There's many more, and I will be happy to share those, um, uh, the links in the chat. Um, but I want to go ahead and make sure my colleagues have some time to do their introductions. That's great, Liz. Thank you so much. Liz's work is really important uh, and you know really um, in touch with what educators are doing. So thanks so much for sharing that and do take a look at her work. Uh, let's see, Don, next. Uh, yeah, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my work focuses on uh, large scale instructional improvement. Um, developing schools and districts and networks that support continuous improvement in the day-to-day -day work of students and teachers in classrooms. Um, I also study the, the national, federal, and state policy contexts that motivate this work, that enable this work, and that can sometimes really complicate this work. Um, as for the pandemic, um, my primary lesson learned centers on the challenge of disrupting public schooling as we know it. Um, I mean, that's what you hear from so many reformers all the time, turnaround, transformation, fundamental change. Um, but it's difficult to imagine a more comprehensive and universal intervention into US public education than the pandemic, immediately shutting down place-based learning and pivoting to online learning. Yet, Almost immediately, we heard the mantra, when will things be back to normal? I just want things to be back to normal. 
And by this coming September, that's what we're likely to see. Most things will be back to normal with some incremental evolutionary changes at the margins. And to me, what I think is really interesting about that is that it's really clear evidence of the resilience of public schooling as a collective social routine. It's a real check on the rhetoric and the aspirations for transforming public education that you hear out of so many reformers. And it's real insight into the type of evolutionary change that really is the hallmark of, of US public education. So that's, that's one of the things that I found most really interesting and most curious. Um, an unimaginably comprehensive intervention and uh, what so many people um, hope will be a quick snap back um, to normal. Thanks, Don. And of course, you know, the cynical side of me wonders how much of that is just really about people wanting childcare. So hopefully we can take up that question. How, how much change will we really see um, as people want to go, quote, back to normal? Chris. Hi, everyone, and uh, I'll echo what everyone said. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Chris Quintana, and my research is around learning technologies. I've been doing a variety of learning technology projects um, over the years, looking at exploring how um, emerging technologies and new media can be used uh, to support learning and to scaffold learning in different ways. And I've done so uh, both at the K-12 level and uh, more recently, starting to look at different kinds of um, tools such as uh, virtual reality, augmented reality tools at the university level and thinking about how we can start to use these uh, different tools in effective ways. Um, in terms of uh, my lesson learned during the pandemic, I think I will uh, focus on the work we did in teaching our students, teaching our own students at the university. Um, and kind of reflecting back on the challenge that we had when we were thrust into the remote learning situation um, where we had to think about um, how to switch over to remote learning and trying to not just do what we always do in in-person classes in the remote learning situation. They're two completely different contexts. And, I, and the challenge was how do we kind of try to to do something for a remote learning context and do so um, in a situation where even our own university students weren't going to have a completely equitable framework at home. Uh, we might think that university students have all the technology and all the internet access, but that wasn't necessarily the case. And we still had students who, um, our own students who had challenges with technology access and challenges with internet access. So trying to just think about how do we make uh, this change and how do we uh, just try to, to do some, some different things? And I guess the big lesson learned was we can try some different things. And you know, sometimes uh, even though those things were in a particular situation, it turned out that we may have discovered some approaches that um, I may continue to use even post pandemic. Um, so even things like uh, recording my lectures so that we don't attempt to try and do a live lecture in a Zoom context so that students had more freedom to view the lectures whenever they wanted, or even trying new things with our uh, approach in class with assignments and grades. Uh, we tried out an approach called specifications grading where instead of focusing on the, num on the points and the grade one gets with their assignments, um, we set up different sets of assignments that corresponded to different class grades and really made detailed rubrics along with each assignment. So you didn't get points, but you had to successfully complete an assignment. And if you had to try it multiple times, we let you try it multiple times. We were trying to kind of get away from all of the pressure around points during the pandemic, which was already pressure packed as it was. And you know, these were things that I wanted to try out because of the situation we were in. But over the course of time, we heard from students who have, have asked, will you keep doing this even after the pandemic? Um, you know, we heard from students who said they liked having the lectures recorded because they can view them at their own pace and they can go back and they can view it multiple times. And you start to realize, well, that's things they can't do during the live lecture. Uh, there's no rewind button on Professor Quintana in the middle of lecture. So, um, you know, 
students also commented on the specification the specifications grading approach where they liked the focus on let me try to get this assignment done well versus just this kind of battle to try and get more and more points or to try and get the right number of points for the grade it was more of a focus on just trying to do good work kind of in a portfolio uh, mechanism the way you would think about a portfolio it's not so much about the points you're getting but about the quality of the, the work and giving students the opportunity to continue working on these assignments till they reached uh, uh, a point of satisfactory on their different assignments so i think that was the lesson for me we can try some things out i think the pandemic forced us to try some things out um, which was scary but also quite interesting and quite um, quite an adventure that may pay off even after the pandemic. And so um, I think that would be the, the lesson I took away from this entire experience. It's a great lesson, Chris. And imagine a world in which we actually sought mastery of learning as opposed to just scores and points. Um, you know, inconceivable perhaps uh, before the pandemic, although we all have done research and, and read research about the value of mastery and, and competency. So with that, this is a nice segue into the first question we got. Uh, we, we're, we were asked this question by Leon Linderman. Uh, he's an alumnus of the School of Education and he wants to know, and I'm gonna start with Don, and then go to Chris and end with Liz. Again, giving you a little prep time there. Could each of you briefly share your vision of the best future of education? So we've had this moment, this disruptive moment. If you were in charge of education in the world, what would you do differently? What's your best vision? So Don, take it away. Um, yeah, the, the, the sort of things that I think we see playing out um, in the midst of the pandemic really reflects some big trends in education that have been developing since the 1980s that I think are really, really positive. Um, I mean, it really wasn't until the 1980s, a lot of people don't fully realize that we realized um, um, uni aspirations for universal access to mass public schooling. I mean, it was only in the 1980s that, that every child between the ages of five and 18 actually had access to public schools. That includes um, students that historically have been discriminated against for many, many reasons, including the fact that they're undocumented um, immigrants to the country. So it's, it's recent. And in the time since then, we've really seen some interesting accelerations in the organization and management of instruction in public schools. Um, owing to um, multiple interdependent to policy presses on schools, we've seen an evolution from school systems to education systems, real efforts, not just to put kids in classrooms to experience some type of instruction, but district leaders, school leaders, and teachers collaborating to organize, manage, and improve students' day-to-day -day experiences in classroom instruction for most of the history of US public education. That problem was pushed down to teachers on their own well, administrators and leaders ran the political and admin administrative point. We really see efforts to reorganize, fundamentally reorganize district schools and networks to focus on students' day-to-day -day classroom instruction, uh, instructional experiences. And even more recently since then, the evolution of schools and districts beyond educational systems to new types of learning systems. These are systems that organize classrooms and schools and districts and new types of networks to support continuous improvement in day-to-day -day classroom work. Um, these are really fundamental transformations in US public education that have played that are playing out quite rapidly when cast against the 340 years it took us to get all students into classrooms. You see all this playing out amidst the pandemic. There was a big access push. We needed to get machines and technology in everybody's hands. And an immediate pivot to how do we organize and manage students' day-to-day -day experiences so that they're actually having rich instructional experiences online and not just doing time. And then from there, how can we leverage some of the interesting opportunities amidst the pandemic afforded by students working asynchronously 
and teachers and leaders and others getting together in time that they otherwise would have been taken, would have been taken up by classroom instruction to actually learn together, um, to process their experience and to improve um, day to day, week to week over the past year. So it's this evolution from schooling to education to learning systems that has been playing out and that's accelerated amidst the pandemic that I think is, is, is one of the most promising developments um, that we're seeing playing out in US public education. Thanks, Tom. That's, that's great. And, and we're, we're a great reminder too of how long it took to get where we are and how rapidly change could happen. So mm -hmm. Chris. Uh, yeah, and I think I'll kind of touch on a bit of what Don said in terms of, of, I was thinking about equity and the continuing push for equity. And as I alluded to in my, my previous comments, uh, thinking about how even here at the university, not all students had, a, had the same kind of technology platform, internet platform. I'm gonna kind of focus, there's, there's a lot of facets to equity. I'm gonna focus on the technology piece. Um, and so, you know, as I said, that kind of forced us to think about some different approaches in terms of our teaching. Uh, but even still, I still saw, you know, the struggle that some students had um, trying to, to not drop out of our Zoom classes every five minutes. You know, I would get frantic emails from students mid-class. I'm trying to get back on. I'm sorry. And, uh, you know, a couple of students said they had to drive over to McDonald's and park in the parking lot so they could kind of grab the Wi-Fi signal there because at home it was just dropping out too much. So I think this continued push, the pandemic forced us to think about um, kind of more equity in terms of technology. You started to see discuss more discussions about the fact that should the internet just be classified as the public good? We have the electricity grid, everyone gets electricity, everyone gets uh, you know water kind of as a basic service. We're at, we're at a point where the internet should be a basic service that is just available um, to everyone in the country. And I think continuing this, this push for equity is important. I don't think we will completely go back to face-to-face -to -face now in all situations. I think, you know, certainly there is the push uh, to go back to face-to-face -to -face learning, but I think there are still going to be um, situations where remote learning, hybrid learning, asynchronous types of activity um, out of school learning in terms of uh, other online learning experiences that, that students can take advantage of. I don't think those are gonna go away. And so that just makes it all the more important that we continue to push for more equitable frameworks across all students. I think um, when, when MOOCs and online courses were becoming kind of more popular, there was this idea that they were going to democratize education, but it kind of turns out they haven't done that because it's the people with the tech took the MOOCs, the people without the tech didn't have access. Um, I think the pandemic has, has taught us we need to kind of continue to push for that type of equity and, and hopefully that momentum will continue. Thanks, Chris. And, you know, I, I see in the chat um, that Cliff, Clifford Craig has uh, talked about the, the point about, you know, not focusing on the flashy technology, focus on the learning. What is it you want people to learn? And I know that um, all three of you were, you know, really singing that tune uh, as we were transitioning. And, and I know, Liz, you really reminded us of that as we moved in in our two-day interval when we got to uh, switch to virtual learning. You, you helped us think about that. What's your vision for the best future for education? Thanks, Elizabeth. I love that comment by Clifford too. Um, actually, I wrote a book called Learning First, Technology Second that really hits home that it's not about the shiny and the flashy. It's really about you know using what fits the learning goal and the, the targets and the need. Um, and sometimes we get away from that when we see all the fun technology that's out there. Um, but I do want to piggyback on what um, Chris was saying, um, you know, talking about equity and, and I just, you know, want to second everything that he's saying. And I have to say that my student teachers um, and, and teaching interns, as we call them, who have now gone through a year of student teaching virtually, um, they have really become these equity and access warriors when it comes to digital technologies. They've seen 
firsthand the struggles that many of their students and families have to um, be able to kind of keep up um, in remote learning, but even face to face if there's digital homework and access. So I think that's a really important point. Um, as far as my kind of um, dream vision, I love this question, <laughs> allows me to dream big. Um, I think especially after this year, we're reminded that, you know, in the K-12 world, which is kind of the world I'm in, um, uh, that teaching and learning is not one size fits all, that there's no kind of snake oil magic potion. There's no one education app that's going to, you know, all of a sudden magically make everyone learn. Um, so for me, um, it's really about um, being inclusive. And um, while in the past we've talked about face-to-face -face learning being inclusive and making sure that we're um, doing that in the in-person environment, um, I think what we learned was that in the digital world, we need to be just as mindful about being inclusive. Um, and that means, you know, everything from when you're designing a, you know, a, a worksheet or you're picking out an educational app, making sure that it's actually accessible for your students. You know, can this worksheet PDF be read by a screen reader. Um, a lot of um, teachers were putting things out that actually were not accessible um, to students who may be visually impaired or have other impairments because they just weren't familiar with the tools and resources that were out there. Um, so I think that that is, is going to be really important moving forward, that whether you're using digital tools in the classroom or remotely, that um, there will be a need to be much more mindful about accessibility, um, as well as a need to be mindful about um, providing uh, what we call universal design for learning um, or kind of voice and choice and allowing students to take up information um, by many different methods and approaches. Um, so they could watch it, they could read it, they could listen to it, they could experience it in different ways. And um, preparing our teachers to be able to um, offer up these different experiences and recognize that students will take up um, the information in the way that that kind of fits them best and what's most comfortable for them. Um, and also um, really preparing our students to kind of learn to use the tools that are around them rather than emphasizing expensive tools, kind of getting back to Chris's point around equity. Um, a lot of tools we use in education are costly and um, it's not something that can be fluid to home and it's harder for them to transfer um, when they are using a costly tool in school, but they don't have access to it outside of school. Um, and it reminds me of, I'm a big fan of John Dewey. Um, anybody who's had me as an instructor knows that. <laughs> Um, and he had a, a quote that said, education is not a preparation for life. Education is life itself. And I often think about that when it comes to technology and the tools we're choosing to use, that we want students to be able to walk outside of the classroom and immediately use the tools to access information around them. So making sure that maybe it's, it's using cell phones or maybe it's using text messaging, or maybe it's using even kind of old school technology, like, you know, a landline phone, whatever it might be, um, but making sure that we're doing the work to find out what's accessible to our students and their families and using those tools and teaching our students to use those tools as independent learners and thinkers. In the survey that I had mentioned um, before, um, the results shared that the teachers who had the most and strongest participation during the remote learning were the ones that had had already been encouraging tool and strategy use at home with their families prior to COVID. They were finding out, you know, oh, you guys have a cell phone, but you don't have a, a laptop, then we're going to do a bunch of things through the cell phones. And so they were already comfortable with those kinds of methods. Um, so uh, making sure that we're really doing that due diligence of connecting with the communities and connecting with what our families um, have as much as possible. So accessible tools, using things that are free, cloud-based um, and accessible to our students to become independent thinkers and learners. That's really great. And I, I have to say, I think my favorite quote of the night will be, I'm a big fan of John Dewey. And I just want you all to know that our, you know, John Dewey was our former faculty member way back in the day. So someday, somewhere, someone will be saying, I'm a big fan of Liz Kolb, Chris Quintana, Don Purak, you know, that will we'll have uh, that legacy, I think, um, to go forward in the next 100 years. But now I'm going to turn us, um, keep us on this equity question. 
um, and turn us to a question that I'm going to just pose to Liz and Dom. We've, we've um, you know, kind of assigned questions to people uh, so we can stay within our time frame. Um, and that's a question about what is the most significant change regarding sustainability of online learning that has been brought to the pandemic situation? This comes from Gregory Johnson, who is also an alumnus of the school. And I'm hoping, Liz and Dom, that you might, in thinking about that question, that you might tie into some of the comments I'm seeing in the chat um, where people are talking about the kinds of opportunities to learn from other students that are being lost in our online space. Um, so, you know, as you think about the most significant change, and I think we heard Chris say, I don't think we're going to go back to all, you know, all in person. We won't stay all online, but we won't be back all in person. What, what are those changes and how will we attend to the things we've lost by being online? So why don't I start, um, why don't we have Don start us off because Liz just finished speaking and give her a little break. Yeah. Um, I mean, as I was saying earlier, I think that, that, that um, the sustainability of online learning um, is, is a bit of a challenge. Um, um, you know, as we were saying, I mean, public education is a great big social routine co-enacted by millions of people every day, 180 plus days a year that's really stitched deeply into the culture and the function of broader society. And as, as you were saying, Elizabeth, public education solves a, a lot, um, uh, many more problems um, than students' um, learning experiences. Um, so it's a big, complex social routine that 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 brings a conservatism to to public education. But as we've been saying, um, you know, uh, we're likely to see evolutionary shifts. Um, some of the things that will sustain this has been heavy investment, as Chris was saying, in in the information infrastructure that and Liz was saying that it takes to support this type of work. Um, We've seen real investment in educational infrastructure that, that supports teachers and students' day-to-day -day work, the development of online resources for curriculum assessments, performance management, um, even teacher eval. Um, and we've seen the development of, of many more social routines around the use of these resources. Um, so, I think that 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 it, it, it's it's the, both the development of infrastructure and the development of social routines that um, are likely to sustain this sort of evolutionary learning um, and evolutionary change that I've been talking about. Um, to your question about um, what's been lost in this, um, I mean, I think it's the same things that have been lost in all our experiences during the pandemic. I mean, you know, what we're doing right here, right now, is both, you know, enabled by technology and mediated by technology in ways that take away some of the richness that we would be experiencing if somehow we were all in Prector in the School of Education, enjoying the physical space, the proximity to each other the rubbing of elbows in the hallway afterward, the anticipation of sort of cookies and punch and time for small talk afterwards. I mean, that's all lost on us. It's all lost on kids. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've walked around um, in the morning um, taking the dog for a walk and, you know, seeing a kid sitting by him or herself on the front porch just waiting for school to start. Um, so, I mean, you know, those social dynamics um, as, as, as present as social media is in students' young lives these days, the social dynamics of being in classrooms haven't been, re I worry that they haven't been recreated online in, 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 as, as fully um, as we would hope. Um, yet, you know, at the same time, I mean, I have my wife's a public school teacher, my daughter was a master's student doing her student teaching. Um, you know, what you heard was at the same time, kids grew tired of the routine of being online, they got better at it over time. And certain of them learn to recreate engagement with each other online. Um, I heard stories and anecdotes from both my wife and daughter about how 
um, different people would arrive in, the, in, in their Zoom rooms and catalyze energy and conversation online much as they would if they kicked down the door of their classroom, burst in, dropped their book bag and said, I'm here. So it's possible and we're gonna learn to do it. But I think that you know, anything that was experienced online um, was complicated by the fact that we were going through a pandemic at the same time and that families were stressed and that children were stressed because their families were stretched. So um, it would be a, a lot to make the pivot, um, but making it under these circumstances, I think, you know, did bring about some of the loss that, 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 that you worried about in your question. Yeah, Don, that's a really great point to remind ourselves that this isn't, this wasn't a test of online learning because in fact, we were grappling with so many other issues, um, you know, from the pandemic to, to the racial justice issues that we all, um, you know, were, were trying to work through and, and address. So I think that's, uh, you know, an incredibly important point to make as we think about what goes forward and how do we know um, and, and not to just sort of dismiss some of those possibilities because we can't really assess exactly what this online experience was. So Liz, what, what are your thoughts about that? So I really want to reiterate um, exactly what you said and Don said, this was emergency remote learning. This was not normally how online learning is done. Usually you get time to pilot and build curriculum and you kind of do that behind the scenes. And, you know, universities and K-12 schools were asked to literally turn around in a couple of days and all of a sudden teach online without having any training whatsoever in that. And of course we spend a long time training teachers to teach, um, especially face-to-face. -face. So um, it's, it's kind of crazy to, to expect an uh, instructor to be able to do this and do it well in a couple of days. Um, and I think in some ways our perception of what online learning is is now a little bit skewed because of that, um, because we think it's this kind of thrown together experience. Uh, when in reality, many schools um, and universities have been doing online learning very well for a long time. Um, but I do think that it has changed how we will move forward with online learning. I think that one, it will become more competitive. I think people, there are many that do appreciate the self pace of it, the fact that they can learn from anywhere at any time, any place. Um, some, you know, like uh, being able to, you know, be asynchronous. Um, uh, and so I think that um, we will see more schools, K-12 schools and universities competing um, in the online space, um, which also means that they're going to have to up their game, that it's going to have to be a very robust experience and not just the traditional log into uh, a learning management system and do a few quick activities on your own and leave. Um, it's going to become something where there are the elements of high quality online learning. And there's been a good amount of research around online learning and what those elements are. Um, and, and I know the research has found overall that blended is the best approach. So not fully online and not fully in person, but actually taking the best of both worlds um, and having part face-to-face -face and part online um, for the learning. And then some of the elements that, you know, research has uncovered is, you know, making sure that it's interactive for the students, that it's not just a sit and get, um, that there are social pieces to the learning. And Chris spoke to this a little bit and he might speak more, but I've learned about some different kind of VR, you know, um, augmented reality experiences like the gather town um, from uh, Chris uh, of different ways to try to get your students to socialize in kind of the online spaces. Um, also, it's important to have high quality and lots of feedback in the online space to personalize, to provide voice and choice, um, to make sure that it's accessible. And also that um, there's attention to equity and cultural responsive pedagogy. Um, and so there's a lot of different elements that I think will be in high quality online learning. And we will see more 
and more schools putting together um, these experiences that are kind of synchronous, asynchronous, maybe have some, you know, face to face components with it. Um, and really trying to take um, the good pieces of both and and kind of meshing them together. Um, I know there are definitely pieces of uh, the online experience that you know we want to keep, and I think we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. So I'll hold off on those, but um, uh, you know it is important to to recognize that there are some 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 good things with online learning. Um, even though, of course, we want to be able to be face to face and socialize. So um, blended seems to be, um, in my mind, kind of the future of a lot of education. Oh, Liz, that's a perfect segue into um, two things. One, uh, a question that Bridget has asked in the chat, and we're going to hold on that um, for a bit, but I just wanted to acknowledge, Bridget, that I saw your question. That's part of good online teaching. Um, and, and that's a question about what will the content of teacher education programs look like? So let's make sure we come back to that. And, and I think the, the reason I wanna come back to it is the question I'm now gonna to throw to Chris, which comes from Alex Wagner, who is a friend and, and former educator, um, is, is a question about what do learners need? And you know, Chris, you're a learning scientist. So th this, is, this is what you do. What, what, what is it that learners need? Because that should drive, of course, how we think about pedagogy and how we think about training teachers to provide um, in, in those or to provide those needs. So over to you, Chris. So what are, I'll say, I guess, what are some key ingredients? I don't have all the key ingredients, but, um, you know, as I was thinking about this question, um, I was I was thinking about a talk I gave a few years ago to a high school honor society to these students. And I called the talk about, it was something like, things you should probably learn to do, but it's things we don't always explicitly teach. Um, and it was kind of getting around the importance. I was trying to get across them the importance of them to be to be reflective, to be good communicators, and to think about what we call metacognitive skills. These skills about how to how to plan and how to monitor what you're doing and how to reflect on what you're doing and make changes. And it's all of these things that are very important for learning. And we just kind of sometimes in class, I think, take for granted that you know students will kind of plot their 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 route to the to a successful assignment or to the completion of their degree, and they'll just do it. But their metacognition is a skill. Reflection is a skill. Communication. These are all skills that um, even with my own teaching, I've now started to think about how how do I kind of make that a little bit more explicit in in my own classes and so you know i was telling these some of the things that i want i can't do the whole talk but the things i was telling students to do is you know periodically write your own personal mission statement to externalize what it is you want to you want to do and the paths you want to take and that externalization is important because it's again reflecting on where you want to get to and externalize it externalizing it really forces you to think about the, the paths you want to take and the directions you want to go to. Um, but then I told them, but you know, as you do that, sometimes you also need to learn when you need to de deviate from your path and when you need to try something else and when you might want to just take a little detour because you need to do that to achieve those goals. And again, that's a very reflective activity and the type of thing that you need to monitor what you're doing in order to kind of take stock of what you're, you're doing and, and you know, where you need to maybe make some adjustments. And the third piece I told them is learn to be a good storyteller. Um, learn to be a good communicator. And you know the word storyteller is a little bit trendy these days, but it's really about communication. And I told them one of my favorite quotes from E.O. Wilson, the biologist E.O. Wilson, where he talks about science and scientists. And he says, the scientist is more of a storyteller and a myth maker than I think most scientists realize. But he's saying you know, the, the word story isn't a fiction that you want to, uh, what scientists do, is they're a storyteller looking for a story to tell. It's not a fictional story, but it's a product of the imagination passed through the crucible of testing in the real world. So it's about communication. And I was telling the students, you're going to need to learn to communicate about yourselves, about the work that you're doing. Um, 
about, it's not just writing papers in class, but you may need to write proposals down the line for grants or other, or a promotion or other things. And being reflective about your communication and learning to do that is another skill that I think, um, as I said, I'd like to start to think about how do I more explicitly integrate these ideas? I worry a lot um, in thinking about my students um, and I've seen this at university and I've seen this in previous projects we did with K-12 where students are so just wanting to do, they do, 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 and not wanna kind of reflect on what they're doing. And, and, and projects I did with middle schoolers, you know, we would talk about, do you, what do you think about thinking about what your next step should be? And I remember one student said, thinking about, uh, thinking about it isn't something I need to do, I just need to do it. And, we, and we're like, no, you are gonna stop and think about you know, what it is you're doing. And so these types of skills around being reflective, mindful, mindful planners, mindful uh, uh, monitors of their own work and being good communicators, how we can help students and support and scaffold students uh, to do that. Um, it's something that um, I'd like to get better at and I think we can think about as, as educators. Uh, so those are some of my key ingredients that I will leave you with. Wow, Chris, those are those are brilliant. And you know, I noted uh, that Bridget commented, you know, reflection doesn't get the A. Um, and and that it, it, I think what Bridget is getting at is we need to change the way that we think about you know what we're what we're assessing, how we're thinking about um, supporting student learning if we actually want them to engage in those things because the doing has been what's been privileged and the product has been what's been privileged. So, so now with Chris's ideas on the table, I'm going to put Liz and Don on the spot. We'll start with Liz and then turn to Don uh, with this question about with that in mind, if this is what learners need and we're moving forward into a, a new world, um, what online, hybrid, in-person, doesn't matter, how do we begin to provide both current teachers and our new teachers with opportunities to really think about um, you know, these skills? Um, and, and actually the question came from Barbara Perlman Wyman. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Barbara, if you're here, who is an alumna. And I think she was really thinking about you know, what kinds of skills do our teachers, our current teachers need to try to address the needs of children as they've experienced this pandemic, whether those are, you know, needs around socio-emotional learning, whether they've experienced trauma. But now add to that what Chris is saying, like this is a moment where we can really change how we think about what learning is. So what do we need to offer to teachers? What do we need to do both for new teachers and for our current teachers, those in the field who are really tired right now, I will add, um, to, to help them move forward and to take advantage of this moment. So Liz, I'll turn it over to you. All right, well, that's that's a lot to take on. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm gonna stay a little bit in kind of just my field of education technology with that, because I, I feel like I could go in a lot of directions, but. Um, one of the things that I, I noticed that happened very quickly um, with uh, K-12 schools and universities did this as well, was they started to just purchase a lot of technology um, without thinking it through carefully, mostly because they didn't have time to. So they didn't do the research. They didn't pilot anything. They were just like, we need a learning management system. We need something to do this. And so they just started purchasing and buying and throwing technology at teachers. And then teachers were overwhelmed with all this new technology. And they kind of threw them at parents and said, here's a bunch of links of different things you, your children can do. And 
uh, a lot of the teachers and administrators I talked to said they just felt like they didn't have the skill and the know-how to be able to kind of um, sift through all of these tools to say, this one makes the most sense for my learners. We don't need all of these other tools. They just kind of felt this pressure to use all of this. And I think one of the big skills that we can provide for not just our teachers, but our administrators as well, because to get an administrative certificate, you don't need to have any education technology background at all, um, is um, to make sure that we actually provide them with frameworks um, for, you know, research-based frameworks um, in their um, professional development. Um, and if they're at the teacher education level and they're learning to teach, um, make sure it's a big part of our teacher training, not just these, these are some tools you can learn to use. Um, that's kind of a low level skill, but rather this is how you would evaluate tools um, using a research-based framework. You have to look at it from accessibility. You have to look at it from culture responsive. You have to look at it from usability and you have to look at it from, from all these different aspects and angles. Um, and there are frameworks that support that, but a lot of teacher um, preparation programs don't build that in or they don't have the time to build that in. And a lot of teachers are, are old enough that they never that, that they weren't ready <laughs> when they were going through their teacher training. Um, so that's going to be really important is to have those frameworks for our teachers and administrators. So um, when an administrator walks into a teacher's classroom and they're using technology, they can actually provide meaningful help and support in, in helping direct where they're going. And also teachers need to know when not to use technology. Um, I think it was Clifford who said in the you know chat, sometimes it's shiny. And, and you're absolutely right. Sometimes it's just shiny and you shouldn't be using it. Use paper and pencil. Um, so it's really important to also feel okay to not use the technology, even though it's being kind of pushed on you um, in many different directions. Um, so being able to vet this is really important. And then finally, also digital law, understanding things like um, SIPA, COPPA, FERPA um, around educational records and student data privacy is really important. And most teachers and a lot of administrators have almost no training when it comes to student data privacy online. And I have to say, I saw a lot of faux pas um, that happened, especially when this first started. Lots of screenshots of you know, students and in and, and virtual classrooms with full names and educational records. And not because any malicious thing was meant, of course not, um, but they just didn't know that this was a violation. And so um, that's another area that I think we can really do a lot of meaningful work um, for, you know, preparing our teachers better and giving them some some checklists and and some ways to think about it that um, that is, uh, you know, digestible because those laws are really cumbersome to figure out. So we need to find digestible ways for, for teachers and administrators to understand that work too. And just a plug, uh, Liz does all sorts of amazing work. Are you still doing the 4T, um, the conference in the summer? Um, because that's a, a virtual conference that lots of people can join in. And then there's also um, the, the work that you've done to help our, you know, our administrators, our, our um, instructional leaders really learn what they need to be doing to support this. So um, lots of stuff out there in the world from Liz Kolb. So I hope uh, many people will take a look at it. Um, it's really, it's really great. So um, Don, I'm going to turn it over to you. And, um, you know, if, if you can take up some of the questions that are in the chat, great. There's one um, from um, Richard who is asking, how do we walk the thin line between what policy allows and what prompts um, and develops a value for reflection and its contribution to self-learning? So, you know, there, there's, I know you do all this work, right, Don, with instructional leaders and, and building these um, communities that support continuous improvement. Maybe you can help us think about how instructional leaders um, can really start to lead the way in providing the training and support for teachers um, so that they can grab this moment. But if you had some other response plan, that's okay too, Don. Did Don get booted off? 
So um, I don't oh, know that I understand the policy allowed side of that, but the reflection side, you know, I can pick up a little bit. Um, I think that one of the, um, among the many very interesting things that researchers and, and other observers uh, were able to track on um, during this pandemic is, is what happens when you actually give teachers a little bit of slack in their day-to-day -day work to learn on their own and with their colleagues. I mean, you know, the history of US public education is, you know, an 8.30 to four o'clock sort of daily grind, um, going back as far as we can go back, um, a, a planning hour maybe if with some clever scheduling by the administrator that would overlap with a colleague or two, occasionally a co-teaching arrangement but very little airspace, headspace in teachers' days to really work on their own practice. And one of the things that we saw during the pandemic was more opportunity to do that with the move to online. Of course, there was, there was time created up front amidst the emergency circumstances that Liz was talking about. But then through the over the course of the past year, you know, recognizing that students can't be engaged online all the time, um, opened up opportunities for, for, for teachers to actually have some free time in their day to work together. There was incentives to collaborate in producing materials. There was widely distributed learning as teachers individually went out and did their best to try to figure out what it was that they needed to do and do differently in classrooms that they brought then to colleagues. Um, working in interaction with central offices that were trying to provide guidance for work, but teachers had collective voice as a consequence of using their Slack collegially um, to inform district level conversations in ways that was less possible when they are reduced to single voices working in individual classrooms. So this concept of slack in the day, room space in the day. Now we know that if you create a resource like that, not everybody can use it equally well, that there are disincentives, some people shirk. Um, um, but these circumstances were different. I mean, the strong incentive was for teachers to, to, to get together and collaborate in their work, co-design, co-process. And I think that from, and this even continued when people went back to face-to-face -to -face and there were transition days in the middle of the week where students worked asynchronously and teachers had opportunity to work. So th there's just something about um, what immediately um, played out when teachers were given the opportunity to work together on their own practice in ways that historically hadn't been possible for them that I think is a big lesson learned um, for, for leaders in schools and leaders in districts as they think about um, whether going back to normal re really means reinstituting the daily grind or creating room for teachers to continue to learn in the ways that we've seen them learn so quickly over the past year. Don, I really like the way you, you know, you you didn't go right to some sort of content that should be provided in training. Instead, you you thought about the resource of time and the ways that teachers can be incentivized to collaborate. When they're given time, they will automatically turn to each other for support and for help. So I, I think that's brilliant. Um, and this actually ties into the next question, which I'm going to um, address very briefly. And then I think we'll jump on um, to, the, to the one that follows um, where you're each going to, to be asked, how should we continue uh, in terms of uh, format and medium? But uh, we got a question from Arlene Clark and I see she's posted in the chat. I haven't had a chance to, to read her question in the chat in depth, but this question is, is there a future for replacing SOE classroom prep of teachers with an apprenticeship model? And I was, we weren't quite sure Arlene what, what you meant by that apprenticeship model, but I will say that we, um, we work from a clinical practice model in which our interns are in classrooms 
immediately upon entry to our school of education. And so they are at some level always apprenticing, but our work is much, um, it's, it's more maybe intentional and scaffolded than traditional apprentice models where, um, or apprenticeship models where people are simply put in the spaces um, and, and just um, asked to learn by observing. Um, and that's in part because of course, teaching is both um, you know, a behavioral and practice-based apprenticeship and a cognitive apprenticeship. And so we do a lot of work to really make sure that our young teachers are getting inside the minds, the thinking of their, um, their expert guides. Um, and, and giving a lot of time to connect that practice to what they're reading and learning about in research, in um, you know, the most um, you know, cutting edge evidence that we have about good practice. So um, I, I just wanted to make sure that we got that on the table and, and you know, thought about the ways in which an apprenticeship model, a scaffolded intentional apprenticeship model is in fact exactly what we do in the School of Education at the University of Michigan. Not every school of education does that, but ours is, is quite structured and quite um, intentional and planful. So with that, I'm going to um, turn us to you know, maybe the $64,000 question. And panelists, we're, we're starting to come uh, short on time, but I did wanna put Deborah Hubbard's question out to you. And that is the question, should schools continue to offer options for learning, in-person, virtual, hybrid, even after it's safe to return to school and why? So let's see if we can start with Chris, go to Don and then to Liz and just make a, you know, like kind of one minute punchy statement about this. Take a stand and give your, your reasoning for that. Chris? Um, so there, uh, there are certainly challenges to thinking about all these different modalities, but I think, I think Liz mentioned earlier, there's no one size fits all approach to learning and there's no one, one size of learner. And so I think um, there will continue to be different types of options. And I think in this question, I think the assumption was, would our classrooms be in-person, virtual, and hybrid? But I, I'm also stretching it to the fact that there are options for learning that are going to continue to be online um, that students can take advantage of um, inside or outside of their classes. And so I think there will be you know, how we connect those out-of-class learning opportunities to classroom work will be another thing for us to think about. All of us on the panel have built online you know, education. Liz is aimed at towards teachers, Don for college students who are maybe entering graduate school, me um, aimed at high school seniors, college freshmen. So I think those types of things will continue. Um, there you go. Great, Chris, thank you. Don? Yeah, I think that there's um, going to be market and political pressures on, on districts to and and just just professional pressures on districts to maintain um, different modes of learning I think that the big complication will come when you have families and children who want to opt for one or the other and districts face the complicated decision of sustaining two different simultaneously modes of student engagement I think that 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 I mean clearly is very costly logistically very difficult and it introduces all sorts of questions about quality and equity that will be very difficult to investigate. I mean, it will, they'll, they'll need to put in place protocol systems and other modes of engagement that, that, that really dig deeply into the differences in students' experiences under those two different arrangements. And that will be really, really complicated for students who work remotely, just because that's such private work in their own homes the idea that we'll be able to fully understand the student experience um, in the ways that we will um, by observing and engaging students in classrooms is, is just so fundamentally different. So I think that you know, the, the, the big problem will be if pressed how to manage the costs to, to maintain two very different modes of engagement, how to manage the costs and logistics and how to put in place some sort of quality assurance sort of, sort of strategies and approaches 
that, that, that really develop rich understanding of differences in students' um, experiences under both sets of arrangements. Thanks, Don. Really good points about costs. And, and actually, that, that will take us to our next question. So you can pick up on that point uh, in, in just a minute after Liz shares her, her thoughts on this with us. Well, I'm going to give a hearty yes and take a stand. And the reason, a couple of reasons, one is because not all students feel safe in a face-to-face -face classroom environment. And I think we've learned that, um, especially black and brown students, um, uh, have expressed that you know face to face wasn't always safe and comfortable for them, um, and that online for some has actually been um, a more positive experience. Um, so there's a lot to learn from that. Um, but also um, there's 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 equity issues where actually sometimes online is more accessible. For example. Um, as a parent, I love having virtual open houses and virtual PTO meetings and, you know, virtual conferencing because I can actually go and access it. Uh, PTO meetings are at, you know, noon. I'm working, you know, uh, but I can virtually join in on a Zoom through my phone, um, you know, just to access that. Um, so I think there are some some actual more accessible options sometimes with online. So we do want to keep those options and avenues open. Excellent. Well, that really, the, these questions around equity and, and cost take us to this next question um, that uh, Gail, and Gail has left us, uh, she, she private messaged me to say she had to leave, so it's unfortunate, but um, Gail asked us, how can urban districts compete toward excellence with suburban districts that are more well-funded? And we thought we'd toss that to Don because you know, Don, Don does this work around, um, you know, educational leadership and policy. So Don, can you weigh in on that? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, there's funding disparities um, between districts that, that have some disadvantaged as compared to others. Um, affluent suburban districts as compared to urban districts, certainly there's a, a lot of variation among suburban districts in the resources they have to support students. Um, but I don't think these funding disparities rule out possibilities for success. And, and we have evidence that, that that's the case. I mean, earlier I talked about this evolution in districts from mass schooling systems that just provided access to instruction to education systems that organize and manage the day-to-day -day work of students in classrooms with teachers with the aim of improving quality and reducing disparities to new types of learning systems that get better at that over time, um, we're seeing increasing evidence of districts, some urban, um, some not as richly funded, supporting institutionalized funding streams like Title I, leveraging supplemental funding streams that show up every now and then like school improvement grants to evolve along these dimensions in ways that support uncommon success among students. Um, one of the big flagships, um, uh, of this is, is right now is getting beginning to get some buzz is Chicago public schools. There's a narrative emerging out of Chicago about long-term sustained improvement efforts straddling CPS and external partners, one notable one being the Chicago Consortium on School Research that are really beginning to yield dramatic declines and dropouts, dramatic increases in graduation rates and dramatic increases in transitions into post-secondary education. We're seeing um, case studies coming out that report similar evolution. A good colleague of mine and a graduate of the University of Michigan, Josh Glazer, has been in the Memphis public schools for a long time and has a very similar story that he's telling about change efforts in the, in the innovation zone, the I zone in Memphis. Their evolution from just a mass schooling system that afforded instruction, highly balkanized, highly fragmented to a coherent educational system with capabilities for continuous improvement, producing um, in his study, um, elementary mathematics results of the sort that people just didn't expect. I recently reviewed a book from the Oxford University Press by, um, um, well, I, I shouldn't say who's it, but, but it's somebody whose name you would recognize a frequent op-ed contributor to the New York Times, Washington Post, and other uh, big media outlets is, is telling um, a very similar story about three very different under-resourced districts spread out across the country 
where the key driving matters are, A, in his story, a keen focus on the individual child, just a, 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 a just relentless attention to, to, to children as individuals, um, um, elementary, middle, and at their adolescence age in high school, the redevelopment of districts as educational systems in which there's, there's instructional infrastructure, um, systems to support the use of infrastructure and in practice, performance management systems, complex relationships with community partners and environments, complex leadership infrastructures to support all of the proceeding, providing opportunity for students in classrooms of the sort that wasn't possible when all responsibility for student learning was pushed down to individual teachers and results of the sort that nobody really anticipated. And so this evidence with theory sitting behind it, I think will begin to contribute to a very different narrative about the possibility of urban, and a lot of the time that's code for a lot of different things other than underfunded, that urban schools can, can, can produce um, um, support success for students um, a, 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 of the sort that, that um, no, I'm not talking about knocking it over the center field fence. I mean, this is about evolutionary improvement, positive improvements in the directions that all of us would hope um, to see them. So I, I do think that, that, that um, um, there was a lot of kind of code in the question, but I, I, I think that, that um, um, the story doesn't begin and end with the fact that there are more resources in one place and less than another. It's how you use those resources. Right, and this is always just such an enormous challenge, right, for districts as they think about um, the, the kinds of resources that they have and the kinds of pressures they have. Um, and I know in my work with Detroit Public Schools, um, you know, as they entered the pandemic, um, just the challenge of finding the tools for children to, to, to be able to use and now coming back um, and getting everyone back into the space. The, those resource challenges are, um, they're real and they're, they definitely are present, but I like your, your spin on the, we can do this work um, if we think equity, about equity and we really try to, to push the resources um, in the right directions and, and use them well. So um, we're, we're running short on time and we have one more question that came from the audience, but I did um, wanna make sure that I acknowledged um, two things in the, that I'm seeing in the chat. Um, first of all, I just wanna uh, emphasize that our approach um, is actually a, a, an intensive um, apprenticeship approach and we actually have a residency program that follows on that apprenticeship approach. So what Bridget describes in the chat with the French system, we are also doing in our system in which these new teacher residents are getting paid, but they are also continuing to be supported so that we're providing really five years of training. So two years of pre-service training and then three additional years of residency. And I wanted to tie that to our former colleague, Arnitha Ball's point. Um, Arnitha's here from uh, visiting us from Stanford, uh, but uh, Arnitha and I kind of grew up together here in the School of Education. Um, she makes the point that most teachers and teacher educators actually have insufficient training in meeting the needs of diverse student populations. And how might we work toward preparing teachers to meet the needs of an increasingly diverse student population and work on diversity in our teaching force. And Arnitha, this is definitely something I know Stanford's working on this, we're working on this. And one way that we're doing that is actually thinking about this residency program um, in a school in Detroit, really focused, the school's focused and we're focused on how we do anti-racist and decolonizing teacher education. So I, I wanted to just put a pin in that um, and, and make Arnitha's point, I think, that we can't rely strictly on apprenticeship because we need to actually create new ways of doing education. And so we're, we're actively working with our colleagues in the field 
to really try to produce those new ways of doing education. Now that takes us to um, one of our last questions and I'm gonna toss this one to Chris. Um, and this question comes from Jacob Fortman who is an alumnus um, and he says digital tools are also cultural artifacts. How can we use these tools to reflect on larger social and historical questions? And I think that dovetails nicely with this question of how do we change the way we're educating, not just in terms of medium and venue, but also what we're teaching teachers to be able to do in terms of um, standing up for justice and equity um, and really working to think about the role um, of race and racism in our society. So Chris, I'm gonna send that one to you to talk about digital tools as cultural artifacts. Okay, th there's a lot in this question. There's a lot to unpack here. So I'll try to do it justice. But as I was, I was thinking about this question, what came to mind initially, you know, uh, tools reflect their creators. And, you know, as, as we create uh, our tools, they, they reflect uh, you know, the, the biases and the, the, the attitudes that are the creators of those tools bring to them. And what initially came to mind was the, and I've been having these conversations with many on campus, including Jacob, but um, what came to mind is the, the increasing discussions we've been seeing in the media about um, algorithms, artificial intelligence, and these other tools that are being used to make decisions um, and where the tools are exhibiting the, the, the bias that comes maybe from their designers, but maybe from the training that the tools undergo. So tools that um, are used for facial recognition and wind up misidentifying people of color, college admissions algorithms that are also funneling uh, black and Latino students into the, the, the wrong directions in terms of of advising, but also just eliminating them from uh, admission because of issues with the tools. And so I was thinking about that um, initially. And, and I think what, what I was realizing is, you know, we use different tools for a certain purpose, but can we also think about issues around those tools to have broader conversations in our classrooms around societal issues? Uh, we use Canvas as our learning management system on, on campus, and Canvas tracks everything that a student does in campus and in Canvas. And when we tell students this, they're kind of shocked and they're like, well, isn't that a bit invasive? And is that an invasion of privacy? Um, similarly, I use Perusal as a social annotation tool in class where students can annotate their readings uh, together so they can see each other's questions and comments. And Perusal similarly tracks everything that a student does now it does this to try and give the instructor a way of evaluating students, but students again, find this a little bit unsettling and I don't use these, uh, these functions of perusal, but you know, we, it actually has led to discussions in class about privacy and about learning analytics and the idea of learning analytics and the ideas of uh, are, are we being invasive um, in what students are doing. And so I think, I hope that's what Jacob was getting at with these questions that we can use these tools for their stated purpose, but can we also use these tools um, as the, the launch pad for larger discussions about what we're seeing around technology and its impact uh, in society and its use and its misuse um, with different populations of learners? That's my take on it. <laughs> And there's, I'm sure, Chris, so much more that you could say on this. <laughs> yeah. Chris and I taught together uh, twice, um, and I see some of our, our former students are, are on the call, Chris. Um, so we have a lot to say about uh, digital tools and, and new media, new literacies as uh, cultural artifacts. But unfortunately, we've already gone over our time, and we didn't even get to all the questions that were sent in, let alone all the potential questions in the chat. I didn't get a chance to, to open this up for everyone. Um, I'm happy to stay beyond um, our time and uh, address any questions that, that you might have. Um, I, I know we had a question from Michael Teeley and Michael, if you're still on, I'm, I'm happy to stay and talk with you about that. I won't promise our, our wonderful panelists um, 
uh, time, but uh, if, if they want to stay, they can also stay and chat with you all. Thank you all for joining us tonight. This has been um, you know, really edifying and, and engaging for me. And I hope that you felt um, you got something out of this. The uh, recording will be available as Erica shared um, earlier with, with everyone who registered. Um, and we will be having more centennial conversations in the fall. We delayed some of our centennial celebrations because we wanted to try to be in person, but what we're going to do is, uh, is have those conversations in person, but also stream them. So we hope you will join us. Uh, we're going to turn our centennial conversation into a welcome to the, to our second century. So um, this will, will be a shift as we move forward into that second century for the School of Education. Thank you all for being here. It's been uh, great fun to talk with you. I'll hang around a little bit uh, if, if Michael or anyone else wants to stay and chat. And thank you, thank you, thank you to our amazing panelists. As you can see, brilliant scholars, uh, they're leading the way in the School of Education um, and really helping us think about teaching and learning. So have a good evening, everyone. And don't forget to go blue. Take care. Bye-bye.